All right. So this is my Travis Bean. I think it's a 78. I'm not quite sure. I've had it for maybe four or five years or something. But uh, it's my favorite guitar I've ever owned. I got it at Southside Guitars in New York, yeah. Cool thing about that custom color makes it a little rarer than the, oh. the natural. Okay, I did not know that. I'm learning more. <laughs> All right. I mean, when I got hip to these guitars, I, 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 I wanted one, yeah. I didn't really know about them as a younger person. Maybe like later, in my late 20s or something, I was like, whoa, what are those, you know? It just seemed like all the heavy bands had Travis Beans, you know? But really when I played it, I was like, okay, now I want one. Because it's the best playing guitar I've ever played. I don't know why some people don't like it. A lot of my friends that are insane guitar players don't like playing this guitar for some reason, but I love it. I don't really know what it is. It is just the feel of it, you know? I, I can play it better, I think, or more comfortably than my other guitars. And I, it's probably the neck. It's kind of thin, but really, but wide. Don't know, I, I really don't know why. It just feels the best. It's actually lighter than my Les Paul too, which is weird. You would think it'd be heavier, you know? And it's loud, it's really, really loud. If like a Les Paul's frequency range is here, the Travis Bean's like this. Like it's just wider in every way and louder in every way. It's, you know, almost like a, like a stereo receiver where you just like turn all the EQs up. It's just like maxed out. You know, you don't, it's not really meant for mellow stuff or nice sounding guitar, but for heavy music and for loud music, it's kind of the, the one. I mean, dude, it's kind of nuts how indestructible they are. So for touring, it's pretty, it's pretty dope. This is a B25, right? I just got it, so I'm a little, I'm a little unsure, but you know, I got this thing because it was, it had a broken neck, a, 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 a fixed headstock, and um, it looks pretty beat up, but it sounds amazing. So for a touring acoustic, you know, I don't want anything to happen to this thing, but if it did, I'd be like, okay, it's not my Martin at home. But this thing really sounds great and it sounds really punchy and mid-rangey. And for like a live acoustic thing, for more aggressive stuff, it really cuts, it's nice. And then Emmett has a, a Martin and together it's like a complimentary EQ kind of a frequency thing. Yeah, it's really fun, it, it stays in tune and super loud. No pickup? Nope, nope, Mike. Yeah, I don't know. I, I started getting into standing up and playing acoustic sets and then having a mic, it just sounds the best. It's a little harder, a little more unwieldy, a little sketchier. You know, stuff can just go, go off the rails, but sounds the best. And the, and the pickup just, it kind of sounds like a pickup. And I, I like to do that with the acoustic set with the vocal mic, you know, you <laughs> lean back. Hi. <laughs> you know, you can like lean back and go in and kind of freak people out. If, if you know, if you start the set far, far back and then you come in really close, you can get really loud and kind of freak people out a little bit. It's fun. It's fun. Really so. Well, I first heard the Hyperfuzz maybe in like 2011 or something at my buddy uh, Eric Bauer's studio, Bauer Mansion. And we were working on a record and he, he kept being like, no man, you gotta try this pedal. And I had the like, okay, boss pedal, I don't know, sure. And then he, we plugged it in and it was so nasty. And uh, I didn't get around to getting one for a while, but it was on that record. And then I got into the, 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 the Super Fuzz and then I realized that this was a kind of a clone or, or in the realm of an, an ode to a super fuzz, at least the fuzz one setting. I don't know, I didn't see anybody playing it that I knew, just kind of wanted to do my own thing for a minute and get as nasty as possible. 
So yeah, I got it and it is extremely nasty. And I'm really into DI stuff and this thing DI is really, really cool. It's like glitchy. Like if you like blow it out with a preamp, mm -hmm. it's just really nasty. I love the idea, so it's like the two worlds, you know? And there's like the blend of the two, but there's like the idea of space and air and, you know, a room. Then there's the idea of no space, no air, nothing. It's like this. And I love that. They're both really cool things. Yeah. Now, where did I get this? I got it when I was on tour with Tim, White Fence, Tim Presley. Done a couple collaborative records and we were on tour for the last one and I don't know where the hell I was but I'm always on the lookout for weird pedals and I just love DOD shit and this just, it looked like it was gonna be nasty and it's extremely nasty. Yeah, it's totally obnoxious. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> then then you, then you turn the fuzz on and it's like. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. But very fun, very, very fun. Don't even get me started, I'll just, I'll just. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, a Tide pedal board without some death by audio. Yeah, so my favorite pedal that they ever did, I have as a backup. I don't like to play it, because, uh, I don't know, these are become harder to find, is the Octave Clang. It's my favorite pedal that DVA has done. This DI is the shit. It's like the secret weapon. And now I'm telling everybody about it. This DI I've done on, I don't know, man, like the past five records I've done or something, except for this one, because it's more acoustic stuff. But, um, but this has a setting, the Apocalypse, that's based on the octave clang. So I have it on the octave clang setting. So this is kind of my octave clang. And with the volume up all the way and the drive down, it has that gating really nicely, so it doesn't feed back. So I really like the gating element. So you can, you can have it on and, do, and have space, which is why I like DI stuff a lot, because there's a lot of space, you can like chop it. So I'll just put this here, because it's, it's basically there. Yeah, I might, I might need, need it. Double clang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's that gate. Right, and then you do the flange, right? Flange. You know, and then. It's kind of always have it on the most fucked up setting possible. It's like the, f the fucked setting, you know? Extra question mark setting? I don't know. The uh-oh setting. What's so cool about it is it has a drive setting and all the normal stuff, but it always cuts through what, what you're playing. So you can be soloing and then you stop and it'll just go off the rails and then you can cut through again. Other delay pedals I've used, it's harder when you have that setting going to cut through again. I wish they made these still. I don't think they do anymore. Which is, it's, this is the best delay pedal I've ever had. Yeah, it really just does freeze like really well. I mean, it's pretty crazy. You gotta like stop it in time or whatever, but you, you know, if you go. <laughs> pretty fun. I really have given up on the recreation of the record. Maybe, maybe day, day one, unless it's the band performing live in the studio with no overdubs, then you can do it. But um, I think it's a really good thing to give new life to songs, a different interpretation. I mean, all my favorite bands do that. It just depends on the song. You know, like certain things are pretty hard to recreate. You know, like, I don't think if there's a piano on the record, we probably, we're too loud. 
to, to play a piano on stage. We don't usually blend the acoustic and electric stuff together. That's a little too wild. Uh, we've never even really tried it, but I know it just wouldn't work because we're so loud. I love the challenge of getting as like raw as possible. It's a really scary thing and you know that record is kind of scary for me in ways because it is just a voice like this. You can't hide behind anything. It's cool though. It's fun. It's a challenge. It's like doing the acoustic set when it's just you and the, and the guitar. It's like, does the song work? Well, let's find out. Well, I guess it doesn't work. Shit. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do that one again or whatever, you know. No, I'll, I'll, I'll turn the reverb on. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> the quad, my good luck charm. Yeah, it's the only amp that matters for me. It's my main amp, yeah. My favorite. All time fave. But this is a Frankenstein. And I didn't realize what was going on with it until recently when it was being worked on and it has a PV power transformer in it. Yeah, it's like a twin, but with 412s. The verb rules, it's got the low end, which is, I'm all about it. So it's, it's, it's extremely nasty, like, you know? I think there's a theme going on here, you know? It's gotta be really nasty. If this amp goes, I'm done. It's over, I'm, I'm just gonna walk away. I always buy amp my rig. I actually blew my normal cabinet. I normally have a 115. And I blew my normal head. I, I have a um, trainer like YB3. But what I like to do is have the amp on the right have as much headroom as possible so that when I hit the pedals on, it gets as, just as much of a boost as possible. And then this is always maxed out, dimed, like all of the knobs are dimed. There was another amp, PV Mace. Oh, right. So that, I bought that on tour. Um, it's a 100 watt PV head. Where's the PV ace? It broke. Mace. It broke. It broke. <laughs> yeah, it broke. But it will return. The mace will return. It will. Yeah. And it'll be very loud. <laughs> I, I, I used to have a third amp, a little music man that had a, a channel flip pe pedal. And then for solos, you just turn it on. But it's a little, it's just, we're trying to get quieter. Yeah. There's no re it's just too much, man. Well, I'm trying, but I, I can't do it. It's too hard. Well, you're on five. I'm, I'm on five now. I'm trying to get quieter, but it's really hard, man. <laughs>